How did you get your start in photography? It was a hobby. A hobby that I took up because I had so much time uh, available to me when I was drafted in the American Army. As luck would have it, I was trained for Vietnam, but uh, was subsequently sent to uh, Germany instead. Uh, Fifty-one men in my platoon went off to uh, Vietnam, and I wound up having my orders changed to go to Germany for no reason whatsoever. It was a bit of a surprise to me, my friends, my colleagues, and my family. So when I got there, they asked for a show of hands, how many can type? And I raised my hand up assuming that other people also could type. I was the only one that left my hands up at 35 words per minute <laughs> and got the job for, I got the job as a clerk typist for the Commandant of the Third Armored Division. This placed me in a rather formidable role. I was like radar in MASH and I was responsible for pretty much the where's and why fours of this particular uh, uh, command. And when the general left and when the colonel left, I could leave. So I found myself um, with a lot of free time because the general and the colonel were forever leaving their offices. And I found myself wandering around in the days, found this place called Special Services that contained a facility called the Dark Room. And, um, and, and uh, 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 I just got started by, I was in, enthralled, I still am. Um, I have to mention the process of looking in the Dark Room, I thought it was a religious ceremony. With, with people kind of uh, genuflecting and bowing and, 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 and turning and, and putting things in water. And it was very, very, uh, shall we say, mesmerizing. So I thought I'd have a go with that. I picked up a camera, started taking pictures, won a contest, I won a photo contest in which uh, the prize was a $50 savings bond. And uh, that was it, pretty much, save for the fact that it was uh, Publish in our local news, the Germ our local newspaper in Germany. The commanding general, who knew of me, of course, because I work with him, asked me to photograph him and his family, <laughs> and and that was the as my start. Um, I took pictures of him and um, his family, and I learned then and there the power of a photographer, um, the fact that I could stand in front of. There were three generals and five full bird colonels. That was his family and their respective wives, and that I could actually stand before them as a private and tell them what to do was to me just the most powerful. I, I found myself with this, not recipe for, for control, but it was, it, was, it, was, it was, that responsibility was heaped on me. And now I can pretty much, as a photographer, I dictate the terms by which I take photographs. This is, what I've always tried to in, 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 uh, infer to young kids today, that we are very powerful people in our own right. I've now photographed Queen, <laughs> the royal family, I've photographed Henry Ford, I've photographed Paul McCartney. I don't mention these names just to drop names, but th they are of historical significance to me because they're of such personage that how could a me, a, 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 a kind of, um, a, um, what do you call, a, a mechanic of sorts, you know, um, um, a plumber, a, a, a carpenter, that is my industry, being a photographer. The control we have over the vision that other people see is paramount to me. It's very important for me now to project always the best that can be done. And to do that, you have to be this omnipotent person. It's like being a photographer puts a cloak of uh, a power over you and you dictate the terms by which this person is going to be seen by the entire world. Do you find that people respond to your, your direction, I would say your commands, to your direction uh, easily or do some of them grate against it? I had an incident with Prince Philip in which he was really annoyed that I should tell him to stand up straight. Uh, I won't go into the, the situation, but I discovered that by, I, again, this cloak of omnipotence was sort of thrown over my shoulder. When there was this confrontation that was going on, I took it upon myself to take this bull by the horns and basically, uh, it was a piece of tape that I had placed on the floor. 
and he was to he was to he was to step on with his right foot, and it, and I was I had placed in such a way that when I was backed up against the wall, I didn't have much more room to 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 actually frame the whole family as photographing the whole family. And lo and behold, when I looked through the camera, the Hazelblad looking under there, he was leaning over to his right. He was literally just leaning over to his right, and I was cutting off his shoulders. So when I looked at him straight in the eye, and 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 I and her Majesty was there, and Prince Andrew and Sarah and every uh, not Sarah, um, the, the 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 immediate family. I looked him straight in the eye and said, "Sir, would you mind standing up straight?" All the air in the kingdom was being sucked out of that room in that one moment with Her Majesty and Andrew and, 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 and Charles and Anne and Edward just, just <gasps> this was confrontational. When Prince Philip looked me right back in the eye and said, I'm standing straight, and he leaned even more so. But, oh Lord, now I, I have to justify why I'm here. So I walked straight up to him and I took this piece of tape and I moved it over uh, uh, six inches that way I, I said, now step on the tape, sir, and you can lean all you like. They still tell the story. I'm told by closest, very close to the family, they, they still tell the story. And it's not that you can be, you can't be offish. I mean, I've heard stories about other photographers who, who in this guise have, have, you have to be clever about it. And I don't mean you have to be smart, but you have to be clever about how to defuse a possible situation that could, could, tear the whole thing apart. But it's like being like the airline pilot in, in a plane. You can't have passengers telling you how to fly the plane. You're, you're in charge. And, and it's such an important part of, of, the, of the makeup of an artist uh, that, that as long as they can see, whether they be Prince Philip or, 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 or the little girl crying, as long as they can see that you have the control over this and nothing will happen. Uh, that's untowards you. Um, you've got them. I mean, for me, of all the things that have happened to me, I've, besides working with various interesting members of the family, I remember this one day when Henry Ford, Hen the Henry Ford, uh, had 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 booked me to photograph him and his family, <laughs> and I turned up at his house. Uh, and, and on his calendar, on his day-to-day -day book, was my name written out, Gene Nocon, 3, 3 p.m. That was amazing. I mean, that, that, that in his handwriting was to me like, I've arrived. He had selected me, which was great for one thing, but that I was actually such an important part of his day-to-day -day activity that he penned me in. It wasn't like the plumber's coming and I wouldn't be there at all. It wasn't like photographer 3 p.m. It was Gene Nocon. It was Gene Nocon. And it said, this man will be here. And they had to dress for me. They even flew in a makeup artist for all the women from Paris to, to, to make up the women. And I had, I know Mrs. Ford very well. And that's how I know Henry. Mrs. Ford and I are still very good friends. In fact, she called me before she left for London last weekend. I said, what are you doing? I said, oh, Henry left me the house. Cool. <laughs> Gene, dropping back to the beginning, how did you move from being born in the Philippines, being drafted in the Army at probably the age of 18 to 21, end up being one of the Queen's photographers? Cream rises very quickly to the top in England. They, it, it, if you're good, you will be up there. Whether you're discovered by someone who really is already there, you can't do that in America for some reason. There's just too many, shall we say, either talent or, or, or other resources that are being pulled away. I arrived in England just on a holiday. It was a trip for me to just find my way as a young man. And I discovered that uh, I liked England. They spoke uh, a common language. Uh, and and uh, the weather was nice and the people were lovely and was taken in by them. And I found myself wanting to stay a bit longer, so I got this part-time job uh, printing. That's what I do best, black and white printing. So I found myself doing this work, and, and the business was prospering because of me, because of me, because of what I was doing. 
and I was getting clients. My first client was no less than Linda McCartney. What transpired was uh, I get a call from the um, Tony Brainsby, the publicist, I, I, I now know, and, and he had a, uh, a roll of film, 16 millimeter film. One of the um, um, uh, frames needed to be made into an internet and turned into black and white. As it happened, it was a, uh, it was a picture of Paul McCartney playing snooker, a form of pool, and, uh, and I internegged it. And I did it by the book, meaning I knew that film negatives were in reverse from slides. So I made an internet and I made Paul McCartney a left-handed snooker player, which apparently three other lads before me had, had done it bass backwards and, and, and made him right-handed. So when they picked up the print, I got a call from Tony Brainsby saying who he was and that I would expect a call, and congratulations, and you should be expecting a call, you should be getting a call tomorrow from someone of, 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 of note. So I picked up the phone the following day, it was Linda McCartney, asking me to come over and, and visit with her and help her build a darkroom, and I worked with her since, till she died. But over the year, over the period of a year or two that I was working in this, uh, less than a year, I started getting Norman Parkinson, all these great photographers of whom I've only read about, but I didn't know who they were by face, so they would turn up and, and say things, and, I, and that's how I met them. One day, this rather giant of a man comes in and says, uh, I'm looking for Gene Nocon. And my, my wife at the time said, can I help you? And he and, and, uh, said, no, I'm looking specifically for Gene Nocon. Then I came out of the dark room and said, hi, I'm Gene Nocon, can I help? Uh, Sir, I have Prince Andrew for you. And this young man comes in and says, hello. <laughs> <coughs> and and uh, introduces himself as if I didn't know. And he said, uh, could you help me? I said, sure, what do you need to know? I said, how do you use this thing? It was this camera in a plastic bag, just like he had walked off the street with a plastic bag. And I said, let's get started. And we worked together from 1980 till I left 1990. And I still speak to Sarah. I got an email from her yesterday about some project we're trying to do. And I think it was that trust, that relationship that, that took part. I mean, within a week of meeting him, he was inviting me over to, his, to the house. The house is big. <laughs> Buckingham Palace is huge. Yeah, that's a house. It's a big house. And we walked around, and, and, and the following, when I got back from holiday, I, I to reciprocate, and this is how cool the relationship was, to reciprocate, I called them up and said, Sir, uh, I appreciate your having me over for dinner the other night. Um, I'd like to reciprocate by having you come over to my house, a tiny house. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, and when I got home, that he, he said, you know, I'd like to. Uh, what day? And I told him and said, would that work for you? And he said, that's fine. So I get home that evening and I, uh, I, I, I say to my wife, hey, guess who's coming to dinner? <laughs> <laughs> and she went, what? You invited him over? Well, I thought it was the polite thing to do. I never, gosh. And that relationship st stood a great deal of time until marriage and, of course, things changed very quickly, but uh, I, I was there. I, I would go up to Balmoral, to Sandringham. Uh, uh, I've gone on picnics with, the, with the, the immediate family. There's no no one else. I mean, I can tell you about going out on picnics with them, which consist of filling up uh, this huge wooden, oh, I don't know, it's about maybe six feet long and about four feet wide. It's hooked up to one of their Land Rovers and, and is full of picnic stuff. In, in, in plastic containers and all this stuff. And we'd go on this picnic. Uh, we'd run off into the countryside and, and, and they'd pick a spot, normally this building. There's this out, not an outhouse, but it's a building made of stone near a running creek. And we'd have a picnic. I can remember this is, um, this is almost, it's crazy to think this. I'd be helping. Now, it's like going, if you have family and kids, It'd be me and the family and the kids. It's just a one-room building uh, and, and, uh, and, and with a big table there. And uh, we'd have a picnic there. And then we'd all go out and sit by the river. And I'm just hanging out like this with this family. Like, 
How cool is this? Is there a large staff of Queens photographers? Or? No, they have none. You mean you were the photographer for the royal family for a period of time? I would like to term that as I was Prince Andrew's photographic advisor in, in light of the fact that he alone uh, was interested in photography. His father was interested at one stage, and in fact, um, Andrew asked me to build a darkroom for him at, at, at Buckingham Palace, which I did. Um, and I designed this darkroom, a very small, you know, just, just a basic darkroom. One would think you'd have it with every manner of features. No, no, I didn't want that for him. I just wanted him to get a taste of what it's like in the darkroom so he could practice. I hired a company to come with me so they can help design it. But at the end of the day, basically, it was just a sink trays and larger and paper and he would practice not as much but he'd come over to my facilities in London and and we we would have a, a printing session with him it was interesting because I, I wore gloves as did all my staff because we don't want our hands in those chemicals it cause all sorts of problems and to identify each of our gloves they'll play you know the old playtex gloves you know plastic gloves so my initials would be GN, and it will be KP, Ken Pratt, and, and whoever was working, Ray Reynolds, RR. We had Linda McCartney would come, and she would have M MAC, <laughs> that was her gloves. And when he started to come and, and, and avail himself of, of, of my teaching, we would have PA on his gloves, which is Prince Andrew. And these gloves would hang outside on, on the outside sink. So they were draped over there and you could see the initials on them. So a newspaper photographer came in one day and saw all these wonderful gloves all lined up. You know, GN, PA, MAC, and all this. Is that Prince Andrew's glove? I said, yes, it is. <gasps> can I take a photo of it? I said, well, you can have it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what significance is that? You can, oh, and that kind of, that kind of threw him for a loop because there's nothing precious about PA on it. And yeah, that is his glove. I think I gave him the glove in the end of the day. He's probably got it someplace that this is Prince Andrew's glove. What I may be inferring with this little story is that these were individuals who had a tremendous interest in photography. And whether you be Prince Andrew or in the case of Tim Rudman, as we mentioned earlier, it was the fact that they had an interest um, was to me the only thing that was necessary. And, 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 and with that, over the years, I would have kids come from all over the world, come and say, uh, Mr. Nocon, could I? I said, sure, spend the day with me and watch what we're doing. These kids today, and they remember me. They're like heads, I mean, one called me from Life magazine. Say, hey, do you remember me? I, I, I came over one day, and you're so gracious to let me spend some time with you. I'm now head of Life magazine photography or something like that. I said, well done. So, like me giving these kids an opportunity to see what it's like in the fast lane, so to speak, kind of a catalyst for their own future.